<laughs> well, good afternoon and welcome to Bad Sydney Crime Writers Festival and this session on the dangers of coming home. Um, welcome also to those of us who are watching on Zoom, um, including our viewers throughout New South Wales and who are watching from your local library. And just to remind you, you can ask a question. You can send one in and someone will write it down for and deliver it to me in the, uh, in the moments that we have for asking questions at the end. So if you're watching from somewhere else, please don't forget to um, give us a question. Okay, today we are on Gadigal land. And as we gather to share stories and knowledge, let us reflect on the rich history of storytelling in this place. And I pay my respects to elders past and present and to any First Nations people in the audience today. Um, practical details before we start, please ensure that your phones are switched to silent or turned off. Um, yep, have, give it a go, Peter. <laughs> so that there are no interruptions, don't record the session. And if you're taking photos, please turn off your flash. And feel free to share on social media at Bad Crime Sydney or hashtag Bad Crime Sydney 22. Um, just to let you know, in the unlikely event of an emergency evacuation, we'll leave through the door through which you entered and exit the building via the Mitchell vestibule main doors and down the front steps to an assembly point in the domain. And our security guards will direct you. So please follow their instructions. So we're going to be talking for about 45 minutes and have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Um, and I'm going to introduce myself and the panel. Um, my name is Sue Turnbull and I'm chair of BAD and delighted to be in that position at the moment. Um, and I'm also delighted to be talking to four authors who've joined me here today. Um, they are, working from my left, Rosalie Hamm, Peter Papathanasiu and Charity Norman. And I'm gonna give you a little bit more um, detail about them um, as we go through. So first of all, Rosemary, you were born in Gerildery and you have written five novels, including The Dressmaker, um, which was in fact published by Duffy and Snellgrove. Shout out to Michael Duffy sitting over there. And The Dressmaker's Secret, which is the most recent one. Um, and uh, Peter, you were born in Northern Greece, I understand, and then adopted by an Australian family. Your debut um, book was actually a autobiography, wasn't it? But your first crime novel was The Stoning, published last year, and the most recent one is The Invisible, which I've just had the pleasure of reading. Um, Charity, your story gets even more interesting. You were born in Uganda. And then you moved to Britain at some point, and you were brought up in drafty vicarages, I read on your bio, which sounds interesting. And you became a barrister in the north of England, which is where we have a connection, um, before you moved to New Zealand in 2002. And your most recent book is Remember Me, which is the one we're going to be talking about um, probably most today. But let me come back to. Rosalie, and let me ask you this question. Where is home for you? Um, home will always be Gerildery. And it's, um, it's, a, it's a fraught thing because I actually have a home in Melbourne that I've lived in for much longer than I lived in um, Gerildery. But in Gerildery, my family remains there. When I was born and raised around a farm, the family farm, and that landscape and that place is home and always will be. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Okay. And what about you, Peter? Where's where's home for you? Um, well, I think home is probably um, where you live, most obviously. But I think where you grew up as well is 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 a place where you consider home. Um, for me, it's it's sort of one and the same. But I do have this aspect of my character with regard where I was born and the family story that came before me. So when I do travel from Australia to Greece, I, I do feel comfortable there. It does feel like a second home. Um, when I grew up, um, my 
um, uncle lived around the corner in a house that was almost identical to our house. And I used to just go over there all the time. And that felt like a second home as well. It was just, you know, you had two homes and now I kind of feel like I have two homes as well. How interesting. Yep. That's that sense of two homes and where you grew up. What about you, Charity? That's a, you, you've had a, an even more peripatetic career by the sound of it. I think so. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I've got a home <laughs> is, is the truth. I'm not sure I ever did. Um, or, or perhaps conversely, I have homes everywhere. Perhaps I'm looking at it more positively. Um, I, I, was yes, born in Africa and then um, brought up in England, but we moved around a lot. So I've never stayed longer than a few years in any one place. And uh, when, I'm, uh, when I'm in England visiting my family in South London or up in the North, um, I feel a slightly alien, uh, like a guest. But when I'm in New Zealand, I talk about going home to visit the family. So I'm not sure. I remember years ago, I met my husband, uh, who's a New Zealander, I met him in the Sahara Desert, and that's a long, that's a long, long story. He was a mechanic, had a tool belt, but um, <laughs> we, uh, you know, we lived in England for some time, and eventually he, he took me back to New Zealand to meet the folks. And I remember arriving at Auckland Airport. He hadn't been home for years. He'd gone through Australia, through worked in the mines out of Kalgoorlie, and anyway, we arrived at the airport in Auckland. And, uh, and I remember he, he was holding his New Zealand passport and an official um, stepped forward, looked at his passport and said, welcome home. And I felt terribly tearful. I thought he's got a home. <laughs> this is home for him. How would that feel? Um, so um, I guess I'm lucky. Home's everywhere. Let, let's just stay with, with you, Charity, and your character, because now how long is it now that you've been living in New Zealand? Um, we moved here, we visit, I've visited a couple of times before, but we moved here permanently in late 2002, although I go back home every, at least every year when there isn't a pandemic going on. Right, so you've 20 years you've lived in New Zealand. So tell us about your character in Remember Me, and where is she going home to? Where's she been and where's she going home to? So the, this sort of main protagonist in Remember Me is Emily. Um, and she uh, is originally British, but moved to New Zealand as a small child, aged about six, with her parents and siblings, and lived there until she was 21, when she'd um, set off traveling around South America, ended up in London, and lived there until she was in her mid-40s. Um, so for her, um, home is, I suppose, like me, but in reverse. Her family, her father's still in New Zealand, but she's made her life in London. Okay. All right. And Peter, what about your character, your your central character? Where's home for him? Oh, well, he's uh, an extension of myself. You know, he's a Greek-Australian chap. Um, and when I look back on the three books that I've written, um, the first one, as you said, a memoir was half in Australia, half in Greece. And then I thought, if I'm going to write some fiction, I've got to set it in Australia because it's the country I'm most familiar with. But then, as you said, I, I, I have a second home. So for the next instalment, I, I sent my protagonist to to Greece. Um, and it's a country that I've, I was born, that I have family living there, that I've traveled to many times. And it is that it feels like hand in glove when I go there. Um, I still remember the first time I went there. Uh, and I mean, you asked me just before this session, it's a question I get a lot, which is how I, do you pronounce your surname? Um, and I still remember when I first went to Greece as an adult and I went to the airport and the lady there said my name perfectly. Like I'd, I'd never even said it that beautifully lyrically myself. And I just went, oh. <laughs> Is that how you say it? That's that's beautiful, you know. It's just, well, it was like music, and then you know the food. It sort of you know tends to agree with me. Um, so yeah, uh, when I thought to to take my detective to another country, another setting, yeah, it was the it was the first place I was going to go. Because reading the invisible, um, he has these moments of encounters with food and with the landscape. 
and it, 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 it's really evocative. I mean, you write very evocatively and I, I couldn't help but think this is something you've experienced, that feeling of, oh my God, this is so familiar. This is, this is, this is home. Yeah, just, you know, atmospheric. And the thing about this part of Greece is that it's, it's not the tourist Greece that most people would be familiar with, including me, you know, you, you, it's not an idyllic island or, a, or the, you know, the historic capital of Athens. It's a, it's outback Greece, basically. So I have only ever gone there uh, with a girlfriend and my wife um, at, at different times, I should point out. That, that didn't come out right, did it? <laughs> but I've, I've, I've often thought, um, I'd love to bring my friends here. I'd love them to see this place, but I just know that they're, they're never going to come. So that was my way of, of taking them there. Yeah, yeah. All right. And now, Rosalie, your character, where is home for her? Um, tragically, Tilly Dunnage um, returns to her home of Dungatar, but it's a place um, of tragedy. So um, it's where terrible things happened in her childhood. So when she returns, she has to confront her past and stare down her demons. And she thinks that she's going to resolve everything and move on, but that doesn't happen. She just creates another past to flee from, um, which is which is good because then you get to write a sequel, which is quite handy. But why does why does Tilly come home? Why did what brings her back to home in inverted commas? It's um, this, it sounds like I write tragedies, but they're kind of dark humor. But she, it's the loss of a child when she's overseas. But because ironically, irony is another thing I use a lot. Ironically, she was expelled from the town because they hated her, but she's the only one that succeeded and did well. And she turned into a talented and fantastic character that sewed and did wonderful things um but in that there was a failed relationship and the death of a child and I think in my mind it was that death of the child that made her think well my mother lost a child she lost me so therefore I will go home and so she went from Paris where she was working as a couturier to outback Dungatar and got off a bus and looked at a past and 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 of course um how many people have actually seen the movie the dressmaker quite a few and we all are thinking right now of kate winslet getting off the bus with the singer sewing machine we are indeed so what brings your character peter back to his hometown well just listening here it sounds like trauma is a very common theme I guess uh, yeah, if something happens in your life, you you do look for that place that you can run a refuge, um, a sanctuary. So, um, yeah, I mean that's the opening chapter in my book that there is a traumatic event, and um, uh, George Manolis um, seeks um, you know to to feed his soul in a way, and uh, and goes to Greece for a break. In the first book, what brings him back to that home? Because because that there's another home in that first book, isn't there? I'm running out of homes. Uh, to, 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 ground, homes to ground yeah. my character, I'm gonna. Um, well, oh, well, that was a situation where there was a, a crime that took place in a in a rural outback town, and um, he, he he he, you know, his paperwork said that he'd grown up grown up there. So off you go, you know, um, you know that place better than anyone. So it is that aspect, that sense of, of, of knowledge. But the thing about the second book, The Invisible, um, is that it's a very unfamiliar place to, to Manolis, you know, the culturally, uh, technologically. So it, it does pose different challenges to him. Okay. And Charity, what brings your character home? Emily, well, she, she's returning home quite reluctantly because home um, in New Zealand for her is in a a very small town um, on the edge of the Ruahine Ranges at a very tiny population. And there she is in London. And in the early hours of the morning, she gets a telephone call from a neighbor back, back in New Zealand to tell her that her father, um, whose name is Dr. Felix Kirkland, has Alzheimer's and that he started to fade and fail. He's not coping. He's been trying to cover it up and pretend and manage 
um, but the, uh, the mask is slipping and he started having accidents and making mistakes. So the neighbor puts on some emotional pressure really to Emily to come home and at least see him. You know, she says, you want to see him before he dies. Um, but Emily has a difficult relationship with her father and with, with her home landscape. And so it's a, she's really reluctant to be, to be dragged back into that life. I think one of the things that you do so beautifully in that book is um, Emily coming to terms with how her father, the town doctor, has so cleverly covered up his failing memory, that, that he's been concealing all these different things. But he's also supported by a Maori family who live um, not far away. And when I was thinking about this, this panel and thinking about this idea of home and thinking about Australia as a kind of home um, or even New Zealand as a kind of home, I was also thinking about the fact that, you know, we're a settler colonial um, culture and that really none of us are at home in Australia and except if we're indigenous. And you actually have these, this indigenous family in um, Remember Me. And I, I wondered if you'd just like to expand a little bit about thinking about home in relation to indigeneity and, and the, white, the, the settler people that are connected with them. That's really interesting. That's a really interesting question, interesting way of looking at it. And I suppose that is why I partly, why I included, um, included that family. Um, and uh, for Emily and her father, they are, they're, in, they're another wave. You know, they only arrived um, about 20 years ago. Um, so there's, in, in New Zealand, um, we, I'm sure we've got some New Zealanders here. Perhaps not. I, I'm a, I'm alone. <laughs> um, there uh, there is um, a, there's a sort of hierarchy of these of these waves of settlers. I mean, people will actually talk about which boat their ancestors arrived on. And of course, the very earliest waka were were the the Maori um, canoes that brought those you know, very earliest in the 1300s. So there is. Um, I, I I came this morning to the um, the talk. Um, about um, crime in West Auckland. And um, that was about another community that had come into Australia. And it began to strike me that, that of course, here there were layers of, um, you know, of, 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 diff of there's indigenous peoples and layers of settlers from all over the world. And um, there's a similar feeling in New Zealand, I suppose. Um, but of course, our, the history of our, um, the, is di slightly different. Yeah. And, and Peter, in, in your first book, you also have references to the indigenous community in the outback. Was, was that part of your experience? Or we, did you live in that kind of a community with, with indigenous people on the fringes? Uh, no, I did not. Um, but I felt that, you know, that was a book that was about <clears throat> immigration, identity, nationalism, what it meant to be Australian. So I thought it was impossible to tell a story like that and not have a, the, the voice of a first Australian. Um, to give that perspective, you know, we, we sort of argue about what it means to be Australian, but, you know, reality, as you've said, it's really only one original form. Um, it has changed over the years. We're a very multicultural country now, but it is also inclusive of, of those people. Um, so, um, yeah, it was just that idea of having to have that voice um that gives another perspective um as you said maori it's really quite admirable in new zealand how they've embraced it you know i think we're a little bit uh, behind here in australia but we're catching up there's a lot of work still to do um that's for sure but it's probably a matter for you know discussion a different kind of discussion but um yes in many respects and 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 maori in you know when within um the the tiny town where this book is set, which is very like many real towns in New Zealand, um, just as the Kirklands live next door to um, Hannah's family in the book, the Māori family who next door, that is very realistic. It's, that's exactly what happens in any New Zealand town up and down the country. And Rosalie, your, your town is this collection of very odd eccentric people. Um, 
I don't think you have any Indigenous characters in, in The Dressmaker, do you? No, I don't. I'm not game. Um, I think there's a little bit too much of an argument that hasn't – It's too. there's too many grey areas, but I don't have religion in there either. And I think this is an opportunity, an op opportunity to say that my upbringing in Geraldry was perfectly lovely. All the people in Geraldry were lovely. They're nothing like the people in Dungata <laughs> at all. Um, I was going to say, that's not interesting. <laughs> no, but I, I realised that I used the, um, <clears throat> pardon me, the same landscape. Yeah. And on about my third book, I think I went, oh, my gosh, I'm using the landscape of my hometown. Yeah. I mean, it's not hard to do because in, in rural Australia, every they've got a wheat silo and a creek and an IGA and a chemist and, you know, they all have those those things, but I just use, I orientate myself north, south, east and west, yeah. you know, using Geraldry. So where did, I, I really want to know where those extreme characters came from. And I, I think I've read somewhere where you talk about living in Geraldry and the Greyhound bus and watching people get off the Greyhound bus as this, you know, small town and the strangers kind of arriving. Um, can you tell us a bit about that? It's Geraldry is very flat. Um, and as my dad used to say, they built the streets wide enough for a bullock to, team to do a Yui. And so, you know, the houses are far apart. There's not much vegetation. You can look into people's houses and know exactly what they're having for dinner. You can see what's on their fork. Um, you can time your day by by other people's routines. The the landscape was far away, and it gave a sense of wonder. And I we didn't have TV, and I kind of we we just amused ourselves. And I was the only girl on the block, and everybody else was Catholic except us. So there was a certain amount of war that went on and hypocrisy, um, and. Everything had a story attached to it. Every as it as it does, math, science, everything has a story attached to it. And as a kid, when that Greyhound bus came in, or the train, and someone got off, and the bus went off, and there was a cloud of dust, and you, it was our duty to um, establish who that person was and what their story was. And sometimes they would be on the next bus out, and there's some of those people that are still there. Or indeed, if someone got on the bus and left, it would be, why is she gone? Where's he gone? What's happened? Was there a tragedy? Is she pregnant? You know, all that sort of stuff. And, and, and further to that, my mum did, she was a seamstress. And so people came to her house and got a new dress and left feeling very important and very superior and very lovely. But they also left in their wake a whole lot of gossip. And, um, and it was all coded so that I didn't hear. Um, I was holding the pin tin. But you kind of get the gist in the small community of what what people say is the truth, but what really happened. Yeah. And you know about secrets and you can't, there's some secrets you can't tell and some you can and all of those sorts of things. And I didn't realise until I'd left that I'd collected all this ammunition. And when I left, I looked at the people of Geraldry um, and thought, actually, they're a little bit odd compared to the rest of the world. Um, and you, I realised that the town had its own culture and what, what was acceptable and who accepted them and all those sorts of things were, were underneath the surface and I just found it terribly, terribly interesting. So, so you're writing non-fiction, it sounds yeah. like. Yes. But I've dramatised it so that it's much more interesting. Creative nonfiction. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, for that one, yeah, I've moved on since then. I wrote that as part of a course. Um, and so I was doing a certain amount of experimenting and trying out. And so I've evolved since then, I'm happy to say. So did you get on the Greyhound bus and leave? Oh, yeah, I did. But I, I, I only left to come down to school um, in Melbourne. And so it was on those trips... And the further I reached out into the world, when I left school and when I travelled, I kind of understood there are stock standard characters in small communities. Um, and I came to understand, you know, the distance you get and then you look back and you see, you know, what it's all about. And that was a wonderful thing. It, look, there's, there's several things there. The secrets, which, mm. is, of course, you're 
books are very much about secrets, small you've communities. Got, you've got to have secrets. Well, you, for oh. a crime novel, absolutely. But you've got lots of secrets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't know it was a competition. I, just, I, I um, oh, it's just, again, for mine, it's an unseen part of the world, you know, in the same way. I mean, I've not been to Gerildery. So. Yeah. Mm. It's, well, the Newell Highway. I think I've been through Gerildery. Yeah, just straight up the Newell Highway. That's the way to go. Yeah, so we were talking a little bit about, you know, this idea of sworn virgins. Is that being a, you know, the, an ultimate secret potentially? Well, you're going to, now you've, you've said the word. You see, I, I read um, Peter's second book and came across something in that book. It, this very small region of... Um, of North Macedonia, Northern Greece, Albania, um, has a particular phenomenon, cultural phenomenon that has actually been written about. And I was explaining to Peter that when I was teaching a, a, a class on sex and the media, I used to use this particular phenomenon, which I'm gonna get him to tell you about, um, as an example of um, what Judith Butler called um, the performance of gender. So can you explain now what a sworn virgin is? Because it's fascinating. I'll do my best. I think you can do a better job. But basically, yeah, it's, it's a very patriarchal society. And if there is not a, 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 a son to, to take on inheritances and property, um, a, a, a daughter is offered the opportunity to become a man. Um, and, um, and she gets all the benefits of being a man without sort of, you know, sexual it's not with it's not surgery or anything like that it's, it's it's just adopting that um gender for the rest of your life and then you what you dress like a man hang out with other men um you still have uh well you don't have a penis um but it is society recognizes you as a man treats you as a man and you get the benefits of a, as, of a man and um the, the the book that i had about the albanian sworn virgins had photographs of these extraordinary women in inverted commas who looked like men they work like men they're in the fields like men they i could grow beard they grow beards um you know it's not impossible to to um all sorts of ways in which they they perform being male but the the criteria of doing that is that they are celibate and as Sulari Gentle asked us in the green room well that's a self-defeating thing isn't it because then you know who's going to inherit the land after them and the answer is, well, it goes to the next male unless there's another sworn virgin steps up. But it is a cultural phenomenon. And, and you build it beautifully into this kind of secretive life of this part of the world in, in this mm. book. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's something that's dying off. You know, it's, it, the world is opening up, you know. Yeah, gratefully, potentially. But it is, it's very colourful. It's a curio. It's something historical. Um, and I thought, you know, what an opportunity... To, to, to write about that and, and I guess gender identity as well and what it actually means. Um, interestingly, the town I'm from in Northern Greece is called Florina and um, the Greeks have this tradition of a cafe neo, which is a, a Greek man's cafe. Um, and um, women have traditionally not been allowed, you know, it's where men smoke and drink and play backgammon and gossip. Um, but recently um, they've opened up a women's only cafe neo to you know, have that proactive aspect about it. So I just thought it, it's, it's the first women's only cafe neo in all of Greece. And it opened up in this part of the country where sworn virgins um, you know, have this presence. So it is going the other way. Things are changing. So let me ask you, Charity, about the dangers of coming home. What is the danger that, what is the peril? What is the problem that, that Emily has to face when she goes home? Um, they're on two different levels, really, aren't they? One, one is <clears throat> she's returning from London where she had her own life and could be her own person to this tiny, tiny town where everybody knows you. And um, You were just talking about those tiny towns in Greece and Australia, and uh, it's no different in, in, uh, in New Zealand. Um, and uh, I remember when I first arrived in Waipukuro, which is the name of the, the town I live in, and uh or have lived in and i'm back there now for complicated reasons and um we were invited to, to lunch and you you have to take a plate 
um, with food on it and and I couldn't it's a long story I, I couldn't cook and my mother-in-law had to do it for me and and, and then I, I gave the plate to my husband and I went to get in the driver's seat of the car and my mother-in-law came over and said no 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 that's not how we do it he drives you hold the plate and Emily knows this you know she knows that life in New Zealand is completely different she's going back there to this tiny town um, so it, it's partly that that everybody knows everybody's uh, business and and she goes and the first day she goes to the supermarket and there are all the same people and they all remember her dad and they all think he's wonderful and she doesn't really um, uh, and, and so she's sort of facing that but on top of that there's the sort of more personal memories um, there's um, the relationship she had with her siblings um, which was complicated and combat combative really especially with her brother uh, and finally, there's facing the demon, which is the disintegration of her father, who she adores and reveres at the same time, slightly dislikes. So she has to go back and um, confront the role reversal of becoming, of his becoming more childlike uh, and of her discovering who, she, who he really is and was, which is something that she perhaps never wanted to find out. So going home, and, and Rosalie, I think it would be true of the dressmaker and possibly the dressmaker's secret too, which is that going home means confronting your past. Definitely, absolutely. And um, they hold the past in their buildings and their trees. Um, and you, like I can walk down a, a the street in Geraldry and people just look at me and go hammy hammy that's all they and that the, I, I, I haven't seen them for 20 years and they just go hammy and just keep walking um and yeah and so you have to confront it there's no way and it's not them they're not thinking about it it's you it's the the person that you are, which is part of the reason why Tilly Dunnage feels that she's cursed. Um, and she turns out not to be in the end, but it's the way you you can escape the feeling that your childhood gives you by moving away. Um, but it, the minute you step foot back in that town, it all comes crashing back to you and they all know your secrets. When I go home now, people have got, they've got this thing, they go, G'day, Hammy, what have you been doing? And fall about laughing. They think it's hilarious because I left the town and wrote a book and it became a film. And so they think to say, what have you been doing is really funny. And so I have to keep laughing at the same joke. I go, ha, ha, ha. So is, it, is going home dangerous? Oh, well, it's confronting, like you said. And not, not only you're, you're having to deal with your own past, you're also dealing with your ancestors pass you know because they know things that have gone down that you had nothing to do with so yeah i think it's it, it can be fraught so we sh is it possible that we shouldn't go home i don't know you have to go home there's nothing you can do about it you can't be regretful for anything i mean those people know that it was me that put all those things in the middle of the street that time all the guards around the tree <laughs> even though I denied it and I just got to look at them now as a mature woman, knowing that they know uh, and move on with, no, it's not dangerous. We, we have to go home. I think we, we have to confront that going home, don't we? We have to, I go back and argue with my siblings and, uh, you know, one of them voted for Brexit. I mean, that's really dangerous. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we have to confront them like, like men and tell them they're wrong. It's a, it's a universal thing. We, we all have that going home in some way or another, um, whether it's every weekend to, to visit, you know, an aging parent or once every five years when the borders are open, it's still something that we, we all do. It is, isn't it? And, and yet I'm, I'm, I was telling charity beforehand that I, I come from the North of England and um, whenever I'm in England and um, I remember getting on the train in London after I went to university and I'd get on the train and arrive at Newcastle station and someone would say, how are you pet, are you right? And I would cry because nobody called you pet in London and nobody spoke with a Geordie accent. And it was that 
that sense of recognition that you were saying. But then there was also that other side of the coin that within five days, my mother and I would be fighting. You know, it, it, it's that fraught thing of the, of the pleasure of the recognition. And then the, the I've got to leave again. And your, does your character leave again? Just till you leave again? Yes, she does. She leaves and then she's forced to come back again. Um, and she, again, it's, it's the, the irony of those stories is that the same thing happens both times. So she leaves again and then he's forced to come back again, finds nothing has happened. They haven't learned their lesson. So she attempts to teach them again. But I don't, I, I think it's going to end there. I don't think I can write another second sequel I think that will be the end and the, the the world can decide what happens next mm. but you've you've drawn on you know so much of that kind of wonderful experience of of geraldry does it play out in other books for you that that same background in some way informs your other writing it does and it does you can't help it it's just the way you're built that's where the the furniture of my imagination was put in place on that landscape with those people so I tend to put in far too many characters because I know 500 characters and when you go out in Geraldry you you run into 500 people not literally um what was the what was the question I've forgotten what the question was are you still using the Geraldry? Oh, yes, yes, and that's what I was going to say. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and the humour as well. There's a very dry, idiosyncratic humour to small, isolated communities. They have, as I said before, they have their own kind of culture, but they there's a way of coping with tragedy that is probably familiar to everybody. So that when something terrible happens, like there was a year when there was a shocking drought and we were I was back there for Christmas time and because I'm the youngest I don't have to do much everybody else does it so I was just sitting there and I was looking at the wind whipping off the topsoil and it was blowing away and I just said to my brother as you do things don't look very good out there which is a huge understatement but it, what I was doing was acknowledging to him that I have taken notice of his life's work and how it's all blowing away and his response was the wife won't be getting a new pair of shoes this year um, and it just was a way of undercutting the fact that they were going to probably lose headers harvesters or possibly land or go broke or livestock and there was no water and it was all terribly grim and I I think you carry that kind of humor if you've grown up with it there's a stoic fatalism about it as well isn't there that, you, that there is that this is what life on the land but is they really. don't but they know that they have to get on with it like people in small communities they just pick up and get on with it again you know so peter where is where is your character going now where's where's the next where is he is he going where's home where's is he going to go explore another home um Oh, there's room for a gritty city landscape isn't there, there for him you're right um i have lived in other countries so i could potentially take them there <laughs> um i like to write you know with some level of sort of you know, what's it, when the reader picks it up they know they're in a safe pair of hands that this person's writing you know with some knowledge of the place so um i i suspect um it will probably come back to australia i don't know how many greek books i have in me Okay, so you're not writing one at the moment? Because normally there's a third book. There is one on the way. Yeah, but I'm not... Yeah, I'm, I wasn't going to give it away. <laughs> <laughs> you're fishing, you're fishing. Yeah, no, it, it... Yes, Australia. Yes, probably back here. <laughs> probably back here. Same character. <laughs> well, come on, you're doing no, the series. No, no comment. We need expectations. We, we need to know. But actually what you said about City is interesting because um, Gary Disher wrote a, a beautiful essay about the notion of home and Australian landscape and all the rest of it. And within it, he, he made the comment that um, urban detectives seem at home in the city, but it's when they go out into the regions that they feel not at home. And Charity, you've set books in your, one of your books is, is um, set in London. It's a yeah. fantastic book about a siege, but there's not a detective in it I don't see but. there's a there's a um, negoti police negotiator police negotiator mm. and she seems perfectly at home yes in that particular place yes. so do you think there's any any truth in that 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 um if you're thinking about you know the genre that detectives tend to feel more 
at home in the cities than they do in regions? Well, I mean, um, in the stoning, um, the city detective comes to the region, doesn't he, and has to use, and ha does have to relearn what it's like out there, I suppose, but is able to, is able to apply his city skills to this, this, this town. Yeah. Um, that, that's interesting. I, I don't know if you could generalize um, like that, really. Um, that's that particular book. I did enjoy setting that in London hugely in South London, which is perhaps in, in a, you know, as much as anywhere is perhaps my home where the family are and um, to be living in um, in, a, in, in a rural New Zealand and writing about this cafe in South London right next door to Ballon tube station was quite a joy and it gave me an excuse to sort of sit in cafes drinking coffee and you know there's that different inner landscape isn't there when you've when you've spent time in cities and um, the different smells and sounds and, and, and the things people talk about yeah. um, there are still the secrets um, yes. Of course, you know. Of course, there are, but they're sort of quickly um, passed passed on over that three minutes when you've got to get your coffee in the morning. Because I don't think you would think of yourself as a crime writer necessarily. You have books with crime in them, as it were. But so, what, what's happening in your next book? Where where are you setting that one? The next one is set. Um, I've written seven books, and they're all set in seven different places. Um, and uh, the next one, the eighth, is somewhere different again. It's set in North Yorkshire. Um, one of my books, The Son-in-Law, was set around York, actually. But this one's set up on the edge of the North York Moors, uh, near a, a little town called Helmsley, which some of you might have been to, right under the moors there, a sort of medieval cross in the middle of the square. And it's a, a place I like to visit in my head. Um, and so um, we're going there this time. So tax deduction trip to Yorkshire? Well, it's funny you should say that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I have just been and I did keep some receipts. <laughs> Although uh, it's fair to say I was also visiting all my mates in Yorkshire as well. But um, you know, you can, uh, 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 the accountant can worry about that. Because I think if I was going to write a crime novel, I might set it in Venice. I also wanted to go to Venice. You know, so you don't think like that, do you, Peter? Oh, I, I, I should be more financial is what I'm thinking. I mean, it's, it's, it's all, it's all research. Yeah. Um, I don't know. There, there, uh, my, my agent was saying there's a whole genre now of, of glamorous crime that, that people want to be, go to these places like Venice and Fiji and, and, um, have that seedy underbelly, you know, be exposed there. Um, so I, I do. I actually do like that that aspect of it. I think you can uh, noir yourself to death potentially. Um, something I'm conscious of. But I really liked going to to North Macedonia and Albania. I mean, you describe, and you must have been there yourself and done those drives because you describe these terrible drives and precipitous, um, you know, unmade roads. And and you also have, which is for me, you know, like a real gold star koala um, stamp award, a map at the front of your book. I'm, people know I'm a sucker for a map in a crime book, but you, you've been that journey. Yeah, I, the idea came up. I think it was like, where is this place? Does this exist? I'm like, well, yeah, you know, just Google it. And I'm like, well, why don't we put a map in the front? And I'm like, well, yeah, that's not a bad idea, actually, because it's, it's right there in, in north of Greece. But, you know, it does play off the title a little bit that it, it's 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 there but that people just look over it you know it's it's a part of the country that they usually fly over to get to other parts of greece or parts of europe um uh and there are geographical features which are also sort of invisible in the book and yet there's also a character in the book who who has that uh, quality about them um so um yeah you know it's uh, you could be responsible for a tourist wave to fontina well, it, it's interesting when you talk about the locals, you know, from and what reception you get. Uh, I, I have no idea how I'm going to go when I go back there. <laughs> um, I, 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 you, you, they'll probably you know, they'll criticize the fact that you've embellished here or not gotten that accurate and that sort of thing. But probably, hopefully, an appreciation of the fact that you've, you've you know, tried to 
give them their moment, you know, and it's an area that I'm proud of as well because it's where I, I was born. I'm going to ask you one more question and we're going to open it up to questions from the floor, just giving you some little think time. And it's probably the most difficult, which is what does home mean? Is it people? Is it the place? Is it more existential than that? You know, I, I do yoga and they always talk about coming back to the breath. You know, where is, where is home? What, is, what does it actually mean to you? It is a good question, isn't it? You probably ask everybody here and get um, 500 different answers. Um, I wonder whether home, I mean, arguably it's people, people um, to where your parents are until they're not. Arguably it's a place. Um, I, I wonder if home is to do also with how it makes you feel. And there are places where we instinctively feel this is home and where you have the evocative sensations. You know, for me, I can walk into a house that's got a particular kind of polish and that particular kind of sort of smell of rotting wood and um, melting window panes and the things that I was brought up with and I can feel, feel at home there. So I, th I think it has a lot to do with the emotions that it evokes in you really. Um, so home is an emotion, possibly. Yes, but it may be evoked by you know, the smells and sounds. Um, I, I stopped in Wellington on my way to, um, to Sydney, and I'd lived there just recently for two and a half years at a time of enormous change and trauma and difficulty. I had a child who was very unwell, and I'd lived in Wellington, but it had become a very happy time. And I stopped there just for a night and I woke up in the morning and heard the sound of the kaka, the birds that scream in the these native birds and instantly it brought back everything. And so I think for me, home is about those sudden flashes of recognition. It's so funny you say that because I remember the first day I woke up in Australia in 1982 and there was this, you know, the noise, the cacophony of the parrots screeching at each other and I went, I'm not at home. You know, it, 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 that aural response to that. What about you? Oh, I would riff off that as you were talking. And I would say home is where you feel comfortable. You know, it can be a number of different places. Um, it's interesting, migrants, when they talk about, you know, where they, where they, where they might die, uh, where they, where they want to be, it's often, you know, the first place where they, they were from, you know, and then other people, also, like my dad, um, he, he, he also felt comfortable here. So it is that association of, you know, that maybe vulnerable time in your life and, um, and where, you, where you want to be comfortable and, and a place where you can relax, basically. Um, I've lived in the UK and also in the US and my UK experience was better. Um, and I think if I went back there, um, that I would have that sense of I feel comfortable here. And I might not get that in America again. Um, so I think that, yeah, that sense of comfort and, and where you can relax. What about you, Rosie? All of the above or the former, all of those things. But also um, for me, it's a kind of security. It was very stable. That environment in that small community on that landscape set me up beautifully. And I can always go back to where I was born. And, I, you know, when I'm confused and lost, I sometimes go home and just go for a walk around the paddock. But the other thing I really, and, and I feel quite comfortable and, and I love my home in Melbourne, but I, I love Jerilderie better. But the other thing is, the good thing is um, north, south, east and west, if, I, if I'm lost or in a strange, like I did it here, I said, now which way is Deniliquin? Which way is Narandra? Which way is then? All right, okay. So I find out by orientating myself to where Melbourne is, which is past Jerildry, so that is south, and I did it this morning. And I also I can place myself back there and and um, without use, having to use the compass on my phone, which I find very baffling. And the other thing is um, it's 22 miles from my town to the next town. 
And then when they changed the system, it became 35 kilometres. So now I go back to, okay, that's 70 kilometres. So that's to Rildry and to Finlay and back. And I know how long that takes. So I do all those extremely weird things, which I've only just thought about while I was sitting here. So it's, it's enormously handy. <laughs> Formative experiences that you get of space, yep. of space and relationship to space. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. And that's and you're at home when you know where you are um, directionally. Yeah, and to know where I am direct, directionally, I go back and stand in the main street of Geraldry and figure out where north, south, east and west is <laughs> and where those places are and which way to go. Yeah, it's wonderful. Okay, do we have any questions? Yes, we've got one there from Lorraine. Lorraine Peck, Excuse me. microphone, mic. Yeah, go for it, Lorraine. Uh, I'm a crime reader and I love crime. So what I want to know is, for each of you, was it a crime that brought your character home? Or once you got home, like your character went home to look after your dad, deal with those demons, did the crime happen after you got home? Like what brought you home? Was it crime or did crime happen after you got there? I think we've all got to sort of have a me. different Sue. Would you mind repeating the question sure. so that the okay. people the question to... was um to each of the panelists, is it crime that brought the character home? Did the crime happen after they got home or before they got home? So in in, in the case of um this recent book, Remember Me, the crime a a a, a, a girl disappeared 25 years earlier. So there was a, a, a missing person, cold case effectively. Um, the neighbor and friend had walked into the bush. She was a scientist, um, postdoctoral student. She was up there doing research and she never came back. So that had happened much, much earlier. And the town was still haunted by this disappearance. So when our protagonist comes home to look after her father, this is still one of the things that's hanging over her, one of the ghosts. And as her father's mind begins to melt, she, woolly mammoths begin to emerge from the ice, as it were. And she begins to wonder whether a crime was committed 25 years earlier. Um, well, in The Invisible, um, it's, it's both. It's, there's a crime that, that takes him to Greece um, and then there's there's something that happens there as well um, so why not you know get two for one uh, potentially and the same in the dressmaker um, the crime is something that my main protagonist was supposed to have done in her childhood and was there expelled but then she comes home to confront that and there just happens to be a few more deaths that occur that really haven't got anything. She didn't do anything. She just put in place things so that things would happen. And that was very satisfying. Okay, another question? Yep, no, uh, front row of this one cat there and then one in the front. Yeah, and so call me cynical, but presumably returning home is also a plot device. I mean, as writers, it's giving you the opportunity to do stuff. Do you think you'll use that again? Is it a handy thing to have up your sleeve, your writerly sleeve? Okay, so repeating that for the Zoom audience. Um, returning home is a plot device. Is it a handy plot device? Will you use it again? Yes, I reckon. <laughs> good, good one, thanks for that. <laughs> yep, I've used it before and I'll use it again, yep. It's, 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 it's all I've done so far. So. <laughs> I need to I need to freshen myself up a little bit. <laughs> um, yeah, I've done it a couple of times too. In um, and I'm going to try and not do it. I'm going to try. I tried setting my novel in a city, and I still ended up with a small community of people. <laughs> so I'm sure that I can find somewhere else to go and still make the story happen. Excellent. Okay, we had another question at the front here. Oh, another one after that. Okay, cool. 
I wasn't going to ask a question, Rosalie, but you just said something that made me really curious when you said that was very satisfying, if you remember what you said. And I'm wondering if you meant for your character or for yourself, which then made me think, what's the role of satisfaction in all of your stories, personal satisfaction in all of your stories? And the question is, what is the role of personal satisfaction in all of your stories? Personal satisfaction for the author or for the character, or both? Both. Possibly both. Blimey. Um, I've, I've, it's my experience that I like to feel quite satisfied when I'm writing. That works two ways. So Because you can leave your desk thinking you're a genius and come back the next day and read it. And, of course, we know it's, it's not genius at all. But you just start again. But I have to be perfectly happy with what my character's done and feel gleeful for them especially when you're killing people or murdering them or maiming them in some way um, and therefore it, and it has to be motivated by the character it has to be a satisfying thing for them to do rather than just an accidental happenstance because you've got your reader behind your main character going yes good hopefully that's my experience anyway um well, yeah, satisfaction on a number of levels as, a, as an author, you know, giving birth to something that, you know, is hopefully creative and entertaining, you know, something you'd be very proud of. Um, I'm with The Invisible, I'm satisfied from the perspective of introducing people to a part of the world they would probably never have gone to. Um, uh, I, I get satisfaction and pride out of that. And also, hopefully from the reader's perspective, it's the idea of giving them a satisfying story and creating a puzzle that they'll get satisfaction in, in working out or not working out because that's something that crime books, you know, uniquely do. So it's, yeah, satisfaction on a number of levels for me. I can riff off that too. Um, yes, a number of levels, I think. I, I, was thinking, I was thinking about that. I was thinking about satisfaction, um, you know, when you ask that question, it's not a word I'd thought of applying before, but now I think about it, each book, in each book, there has been something I really wanted to say and, and, and was really angry about or, or, or really cared about, really wanted to say. And I think in each book I said it. So, so to that degree, yes, tremendous satisfaction. Whether other people can hear it is, is another question. Okay, I think we've got time for one last question. There was one there. Yep. Um, I was just wondering, um, it's, it's the dangers of coming home and you've written um, about coming home as a genre. Uh, the, some of those dangers, how you, the, the challenges of writing stock, so-called stock characters, the challenges of dealing with them, the, the, you know, the, the, the local cop, the teacher, the doctor, the gossip, etc., and how how challenging that is, particularly with each book that you write, to get that nuance and and change that relationship. I I personally would find that really challenging. So the question is about um, finding a way to avoid stock and predictable characters in in that kind of um, trope of the return home with the doctor and the policeman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, might start with Peter because I think you managed to avoid it quite well. well. The, the, the sworn virgin that's your uh, um well I, I i i i really like writing about landscape and and place and geography and i think characters spring from that organically um you're going to get ones that are universal you know um you know the the cafe owner but then you're going to get some interesting ones as well um so i i try not to think of it too consciously and just know that if i'm true to a place and you know, true to characters and make them three-dimensional and realistic and compassionate that you'll make a connection with the reader and that's ultimately the mo most important thing you can have stock standard characters and still tell a great story it's just how you do it um what about do you want to go next charity mm. uh, rosalie uh, your characters are anything but stock um yeah you've got to You've got to make them so that there's empathy, so that people recognise them and get on their side and follow them through. And you're quite right. You can write pretty predictable characters, um, or not predictable, actually, pretty stereotypical one, but as long as you don't make them predictable, I think is the key. Mm. That's my 
way of doing it. You can you write it and then you make it better. Yeah, and your characters do outrageous things. Okay, Charity? Um, it's a good question. I try to avoid cliche, I'm sure we all do, um, pretty much at all costs. Although with incidental characters, there's, as you say, you know, it may, it may creep in. But with anybody who's remotely major, which is, and I, I do try to make, I, I, I try to craft it so that each character is real and is three-dimensional. And I think about the things which um, they know about themselves and the things they don't know about themselves. And I try to include those sort of depth of character into them as much as I can. Um, to avoid that that cut and paste it characterization. Thank you for that. And thank, please join with me in thanking our amazing panel, Charity, Peter, and Rosalie, for a um, splendid session this afternoon and for um, for talking about home. I found that very comforting. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>